Hello my good friends, Derek Deschamps here for Internetworking Influencers, your source for free Cisco certification training for network engineers. Welcome to day two of our free CCNA 100-105 IC and D1 training course. Today we're going to cover the OSI and TCP IP models, as well as TCP and UDP protocols. The Internetworking Influencers CCNA 100-105 IC and D1 training course is comprised of 13 videos each focusing directly on a set of specific items on Cisco's official exam topic list. Today's episode will cover item 1.1, Compare and Contrast OSI and TCP IP Models, and item 1.2, Compare and Contrast TCP and UDP Protocols. If you haven't yet looked at Cisco's official exam topic list, I've included a link to it in the show notes. As a reminder, today's video has a set of free practice questions that are available on our website at internetworkinginfluencers.com that will help you brush up on the topics you learned today. The questions are a true representation of the types of questions you'll face on the actual exam, so be sure to check those out once we're done. Today we're going to start things off with the OSI model. I can't stress to you enough the importance of this topic. The OSI model will keep coming up through your studies, and not just in the CCNA material, but in both the CCNP and CCIE courses as well. So it's best to have a thorough understanding of it and commit it to memory right from the beginning. The Open Systems Interconnection, or OSI model, is a seven-layer reference model that is used to conceptualize how information is carried from one software application on one host through the network to the software application on another host. In this diagram, if the application on host 1 wants to communicate with the application on host 2, the information leaves the application on host 1 and is passed down the seven layers of the OSI model on host 1. It then travels back up the seven layers of the OSI model on host 2 before finally reaching the application on host 2. The different layers help people conceptualize where different network functions exist to aid them in creating products and programs that can interoperate with other products and programs at different layers. For example, a network switch is designed to handle the functions at layer 2 of the OSI model. The layers also help people break down the complexities involved in network communication, which not only helps us understand things better, but also helps us eliminate different layers when troubleshooting. Let's take a look at the individual layers starting at the top. The application layer, or layer 7, is the closest layer to the end user. This layer interacts directly with software applications that require network services, by handling things like identifying communication partners, handling resource availability, and overseeing synchronization. For example, if a web browser wants to download a web page, it can use the application layer protocol HTTP to gain access to network services. If a mail client wants to send an email, it can use the application layer protocol SMTP. HTTP, SMTP, POP3, and FTP are all examples of protocols found on the application layer. It is also important to note that the software applications themselves, like Microsoft Word or iTunes, are not part of the application layer and are not covered by the OSI model at all. The presentation layer also referred to as layer 6, is responsible for handling coding and conversion functions. This layer handles how things are presented by ensuring that information sent from the application layer of one system can be understood by the application layer of the other system. Things like data encryption, data compression, data representation formats, and character encoding formats all belong in this layer. Examples of presentation layer implementations include ASCII character encoding, as well as JPEG, MPEG, PNG, and TIFF formats. The session layer, also known as layer 5, is responsible for setting up, maintaining, and terminating communication sessions, which are comprised of service requests and service responses. Examples of session layer protocols include AppleTalk, Session Control Protocol, also known as SCP, DECnet Phase 4, as well as Zone Information Protocol, or ZIP. The Transport Layer, or Layer 4, is responsible for ensuring packets are delivered reliably between hosts. Examples of Transport Layer services include Virtual Circuits, 
as well as end-to-end -end flow control and error checking. Protocols such as Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, and Apple Talk's Name Binding Protocol, or NBP, all belong in this layer. The Network Layer, or Layer 3, is responsible for defining the network address and the logical network layout information. Routers use the information at this layer to make path and forwarding decisions. Internet Protocol is found at this layer where it uses IP address and subnet information to define network addresses. The Data Link Layer, or Layer 2, is responsible for transmitting data over the physical network link. Switches use the information at this layer to forward packets. Examples of Layer 2 implementations include physical addressing such as MAC addresses, physical network topologies, frame sequencing, as well as link level flow control and error detection. The physical layer, or layer 1, defines everything involved in establishing and maintaining the physical link between network systems. This includes the physical cabling, line voltages, physical data rates, and maximum transmission distances. As I mentioned previously, the OSI model is something you will see come up time and time again. I'd strongly recommend you commit it to memory and be able to list all the layers in order and have a thorough understanding of the functions of each layer before attempting the exam. Some mnemonic phrases exist for remembering the layers of the OSI model, such as all people seem to need data processing. This is a great way to remember the OSI layers. However, since you'll be using the layers frequently throughout your career, if possible, I'd recommend you still memorize the layers on their own. The TCP IP model is the next reference model you should be familiar with for the exam. The TCP IP model is similar to the OSI model. However, the original TCP IP model contains only four layers. The application layer of the TCP IP model corresponds to layers 5 through 7 of the OSI model. The transport layer of the TCP IP model corresponds directly to the transport layer of the OSI model. The internet layer of the TCP IP model is the same as the network layer of the OSI model. The TCP IP model's network access layer covers both the data link and physical layers of the OSI model. There is a new 5-layer TCP IP model that you will sometimes see that has the name of the Internet layer changed to Network layer, and the Network Access layer divided into both Data Link and Physical layers. You should be familiar with both TCP IP models, however in my experience the exam focuses much more heavily on the OSI model, therefore the OSI model should be the primary focus for your studies. The Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, is a connection-oriented Layer 4 protocol. Connection-oriented means that a session or connection is established between two hosts before any data is sent. The data is then delivered sequentially, and once the transmission is complete, the connection is terminated. You can think of this like a telephone call, where a person dials another person's number and the other person agrees to the communication by answering the phone. The person's message is delivered in proper order, and once the conversation is complete, the call is terminated. A connection-less protocol like UDP does not require that a session or connection is created prior to sending data. This is similar to communicating by sending a letter through the mail. The recipient will receive the message without agreeing to the conversation beforehand. If multiple letters are sent, they may arrive at the destination out of order. Since TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, a connection is set up between two hosts before sending any data. In order to establish a connection, a server must first listen on a specified port for incoming connections. There are a few well-known ports that are used for TCP connections that I'd recommend you commit to memory. FTP communication occurs over TCP port 20 and 21. SSH uses TCP port 22. Telnet port 23. SMTP port 25. 
HTTP port 80, POP3 port 110, and HTTPS TCP port 443. Once the server is listening on a port, a TCP connection can be set up by using a three-way handshake. To achieve this, a SYN is sent by the client to the server to request a connection, and to let the server know the initial sequence number it'll use for the communication. The server responds back with a SYN ACK to acknowledge that it received the client's SYN. An ACK is then sent by the client back to the server to acknowledge the receipt of the server's SYN ACK. Once this process is complete, a connection has been established and data can now be sent. TCP transfers data in the form of segments. Segments are created by taking the information in a data stream, dividing it into smaller pieces, and attaching a header. TCP transfers data reliably by using sequence numbers and acknowledgements. Each TCP segment is assigned a sequence number which is incremented with each segment sent. The sequence number is incremented by the size of the data sent in the last segment. For example, if we send a segment with the initial sequence number 1000 that contains 500 bytes of data, the next segment will have a sequence number of 1500. After a segment has been received at the destination host, it returns an acknowledgement or ACK back to the sender to let it know the segment has been received. The ACK number will be equal to the sequence number that the server expects to receive next. For example, if the server receives a packet with the sequence number 1000 that contains 500 bytes of data, it will send an ACK back to the sender with the number 1500 meaning that it is now ready to receive the segment with the sequence number 1500 and acknowledging that it has received all prior bytes up to this point. If the sender does not receive an ACK back within a specified period, it knows that segment needs to be resent. The sequence number also allows the receiver to know whether a duplicate segment has been received and can discard it accordingly. A TCP connection is terminated using a four-way handshake. Once each side of the connection is done sending data, it terminates its side of the data connection independently. If a host is finished sending data and wants to terminate the connection, it sends a FIN segment and the other side of the connection responds back with an ACK segment. Once the host has received the ACK back, its half of the connection is closed meaning it can no longer send any data. However, it can still receive data from the other host. And once the other side of the connection is done sending all of its data as well, it sends its own FIN segment, which is acknowledged with an ACK segment back, at which time the connection is terminated in both directions. TCP gives each host the ability to slow down the speed of data transfer if they are being overwhelmed. The ability to slow down the speed that data is being transferred is known as flow control. The type of flow control that TCP uses is called windowing. Windowing allows the receiver to signal to the sender how fast to send the data by controlling the window size. The window size specifies how much data the sender can send before waiting for an acknowledgement back, thus controlling the transmission rate. Here is a picture of the fields found in a TCP header. As you can see, it contains fields for the source and destination port, sequence number, acknowledgement number, and window size, as well as bits to toggle for SYN, FIN, and ACK. When studying for the exam, be sure you can differentiate between a TCP header and the headers of other protocols like UDP, which we'll cover next. So now let's take a look at User Datagram Protocol, or UDP. UDP is a connectionless protocol, meaning it does not require that a session or connection is created prior to sending data. UDP does not sequence packets, and has no form of acknowledgement that a packet has been received. Therefore, it is considered to be unreliable. However, the lack of acknowledgement means it also has less overhead 
making it ideal for time-sensitive applications like voice over IP. UDP is generally used by applications that can handle some data loss and favors speed over reliability. UDP is ideal for applications like voice over IP because if a packet is lost, by the time a retransmission would occur, the data would no longer be useful. DNS uses UDP because of its low overhead, and in the event that a DNS response is not received by the client, it simply asks again. As with TCP, UDP communication occurs on specific ports. Some of the well-known ports you should be familiar with for the exam are DNS on port 53, DHCP on port 67 and 68, TFTP on port 69, NTP on UDP port 123, SNMP on ports 161 and 162, and Syslog on UDP port 514. A UDP header contains both source and destination port fields, length as well as a checksum field. You will notice that it contains much less information than a TCP header. However, both TCP and UDP contain source and destination ports, as well as a checksum field. So in summary, the key differences between TCP and UDP are as follows. TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, while UDP is connectionless. TCP uses sequencing, while UDP does not have any form of sequence numbers. TCP uses acknowledgements, while UDP does not. TCP is considered to be reliable, while UDP is considered to be unreliable, but with less overhead. TCP also has a means of retransmitting data, while UDP does not. And finally, TCP uses windowing for flow control, while UDP does not have any flow control mechanism. And that brings us to the end of Day 2 of Internet Working Influencer's CCNA 100-105 ICND1 training course. Don't forget to complete the free practice questions for today's material, which can be found on our website at internetworkinginfluencers.com. The free practice questions will help highlight the key points that Cisco will expect you to know for the exam. Also, if you enjoy our free training and would like to show your support, please check out our Patreon page where we offer numerous perks to our supporters, ranging from additional practice questions and detailed study notes for each video, to direct access to our instructors to answer any questions you might have. I'll be back next time for Day 3 where we will cover network architecture, topologies, and troubleshooting. I'm Derek Deschamps for Internetworking Influencers. Thanks for watching.